Father, we thank you for your people here. I'm asking you, Lord, that the excitement we have will not be disappointed in Jesus' name. Amen. Your blessings will enrich every life. Amen. And as we study your word, it will profit every life in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. Bless your people, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Tonight, we're looking at Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 1 to verse 2 to verse 3. To start with, Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great, a great crowd, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and says unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have been now with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away, fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from afar. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this world. He came for a purpose. And we need to understand the purpose for which Christ came. He came so that he can call sinners out of their sin and cut those who are under the shadow of death out of that shadow and come to his presence, have salvation, have forgiveness, have freedom, and then prepare them to get to heaven. In the midst of that, and because of that, he had to preach the word unto them. He had to teach them many things. And many times they gathered from different places, and they gathered from far away places, and they came unto him. There were times they will spend a day, a time they'll spend just a night another time three days or more so that he can impart the word of god unto them you've seen in the passage i read to you now that jesus said i have compassion upon the people they've been with me now for three days and they have nothing to eat can you think about yourself attending a retreat attending a conference and going to a camp and just hearing the word of god from morning till afternoon till night the first day no food nothing given to you and then the second day too no food nothing served and the third day no food nothing served and yet you find these people because they were so passionate about wanting to hear the word of god there was no complaint from their mouth and there was no criticism of what a camp is this, what a retreat is this, and what conference is this. No complaint or criticism at all. You find the people of today, for little, little things, they complain. The time, the weather, the fan, the air con, the water, what are we going to do? Even the seat was sitting on, they complain on everything. But these people came to the Lord. They were so interested in the word of God, interested in the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word. All those physical things and needs and supplies mattered not to them at all. I pray our church will be like that. But to see many people today, to get to their fellowship complaint, to come to the Bible study complaint, and to come to the Sunday worship complaint, everything, everything is about complaining, complaining, complaining. And I pray that that spirit of murmuring, and the spirit of complaining, and the spirit of criticizing either the local church or the local pastor or the whole church, uh, that some people do, will get out of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. These great multitudes sought the Lord, and they came to the Lord, and Jesus Christ as a faithful Savior, as a faithful teacher, and the faithful shepherd taught them the way of life and the way of salvation. And the crowd didn't demand for anything. The crowd didn't say, yes, you have taught us the word of God. Yes, you have taught us about salvation. How about this? 
high about food. It was Christ himself that thought about giving them the food. He said, they had been with me now without complaining, without asking for anything, demanding anything, without any infighting or conflict among them. They have been with me hearing the word of life eternal for three days. I do not want them to go back home hungry so that they do not faint in the way. I pray that you allow the Lord to think about you and to plan for you. And instead of grumbling and instead of complaining, the Lord himself at the right time will do the right thing for you and for your family in Jesus' name. I love the attitude of these people and I want to show you that kind of attitude in the word of God and the attitude you ought to have, the attitude I need to have so that in our lives and in our church there will be no complaints anymore. There will be no murmuring anymore. There will be no grumbling anymore. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Look at Job chapter 23. And I'm reading from verse 12. Job chapter 23. We're looking at verse 12. It says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. There are some people, if there is no convenient seat, they look around, they go back. Before we finish, they've come back. Other people, if they do not have some conveniences that you will attend to them, and before the meeting ends, they go back. Or they go for a retreat, they go for a conference, they go for a camp, and they have gone back. But Job said, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed, I have exalted, I have appreciated, I have uh, given more value to the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That was their attitude. They gave esteem, they gave exaltation, and they gave honor to the word of his mouth more than their necessary food. And Jesus had compassion on them. He provided necessary food for them. He provided care for them. He fed them. He took care of their spiritual well-being. He also warned them of the soul deadening and the soul damning leaven and errors of the Pharisees and of the false religionists. And that's what he's still doing today because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. If Jesus came here to preach today directly to us, he'll be saying exactly the same thing he said before. He'll be doing exactly the same thing he did before. He will be blessing us the way he blessed those people before. And I pray that tonight you'll not miss your blessing. And you'll must not miss the teaching. The teaching comes, the word comes, the doctrine comes, the care comes, the compassion comes, everything comes as we receive the word of God and we're open to everything the Lord wants to give unto us. Thank God I am open. I say thank God I am open. You'll be open to you'll open your heart to receive in Jesus' name. Tonight, as we look at the verses we're studying, the topic is Christ's compassion and concern for the fainting and the forgetful. There are two kinds of people here. The fainting, that's one. The forgetful, that's the second one. As we read on, you'll find out he told his own disciples something. And the disciples began to think about another thing. And Jesus said, have you forgotten? What he did in the past, many people, what the Lord had done from the chapter 1 of our lives until the chapter 7 of our lives, they're forgotten. Many people are forgotten from the chapter 1 of our salvation, the chapter 1 of our relationship with God, and the chapter 1 of our praying to God and receiving from God. Everything he did before, they have forgotten. And when a new problem arises, when a new situation arises, they have forgotten the promises of God, the performances of God. They have forgotten the provision of the Lord. You will not be forgetful here. Amen. And so here you will keep 
as you hear you will meditate as you hear you will hold on to what you have heard and the word of god will do good in your life in jesus name the topic again christ compassion and concern for the fainting and the forgetful there are three things we're looking at let me just give you number one is compassion for fainting souls is compassion for fainting souls i'm going to read again from mark chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 1 all through to verse 9 mark chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 1 all through to verse 9. It says, In those days, the multitude being very great, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him. And he says unto them, I have compassion on the multitude. Remember, the point we're looking at now is compassion for fainting souls. He said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have been with me three days and they have nothing to eat. And, I, and if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way for divers that means different uh, sections of them uh, different uh, people have come from far and his disciples answered him from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness uh, they, they were in the wilderness you know something they have forgotten the provision of god three million jews israelites were in the wilderness many many years before and without having anywhere to buy anything anywhere to sow anywhere to reap the lord fed them and satisfied millions of people in the wilderness for how many years for 40 years they have forgotten that that's why we're talking about christ's compassion and concern for the fainting and the forgetful you will not forget all the good things we have read in the bible we will not forget all the miracles we have read in the bible we will not forget everything he did in bible days is able to do today and is willing to do today he says i am god i change not and jesus christ our savior our lord our redeemer our healer our deliverer he has not changed he's the same yesterday today and forever He'll do something in your life today. Look at verse 5. And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples and set before them. And they did eat. And they did, they did eat them. And they set them before the people, and they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. Have you noticed that this time that Christ himself had not eaten, and that the disciples had not eaten? But his compassion makes him to care for the people more than for himself. Actually, he came to sacrifice everything he had, his very life, so that the people of the world can be called and they can come to the Lord. If you only realized that Christ is thinking about you, and Christ is going to provide every need of your life, he will do it in Jesus' name. And even though he himself had not eaten for those three days, and the disciples had not eaten for those three days, he blessed the bread. He gave it to his disciples. And he didn't say, disciples, eat first. Here we have a problem with present-day workers in the church. There are present day workers in the church where we have invitees who have invited and we have newcomers who are there and they have the people that need to get saved and the people that need to get healed and the people that need to have the needs of their lives made but the workers are complaining we have not eaten anything now they're going to serve food by the time we finish serving the food might finish and we will go hungry and would you believe there are some unfaithful workers that will go aside and say 
I'm not going to be foolish. I'm not going to be an unwise worker. I'm going to take care of myself first, others first, and then God will supply the needs of your life. If you will do like these disciples did, and that as Jesus gave the blessing, as Jesus gave the provision, and he said, go distribute to them, and you do that faithfully, seek ye for the kingdom of God, and then all other things will be added into your life. I see addition coming to your life tonight. I see multiplication in your life tonight. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. Look at verse 9. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. But remember, he was caring for them, not only for their body. You see, there are people, all they think about is, God, give me bread. Give me food. Give me supply. Give me a wife. Give me a husband. Give me children. Give me this and that. Those things are good. They're good for this world. But as we look at the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he fetched them. He also healed them. He also saved them. He also enlightened them. He did a lot by his compassion. Let me just show you what Christ does when he has compassion. And tonight, he has compassion on you. He has compassion on me. Say it for self. He has compassion on me. And look at what his compassion will do. He gives bread. That's good. He gives all that we need in the physical, that's good. He multiplies the supply we have, that's good. But he does other things too. Let me ask you, if these people that came to Jesus Christ and they tasted of the compassion of Christ, if all they had was bread, will they get to heaven? If all they had was multiplied fish, will that take them to heaven? No, because that will just feed their body. And if the need of the body is all that we have, if the provision for the body is all that we have, will be of all men the most miserable. But thank God we're going to have more. Thank God you are going to have more. Because his compassion fails not. Look at what the compassion will do. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 36. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. That's compassionate Christ. He saw the multitude. Always, whenever he sees the multitude, he sees beyond the need of the body. He sees beyond the need of hunger to satisfy their hunger. He sees beyond their physical material needs. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. And they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look at verse 37. Then says he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into his harvest. They needed to be harvested from the field of sin and harvested into the Ghana and into a deposit of heaven. And so to get them out of their darkness, out of their evil, out of their powerlessness and get them into the kingdom of God, that's why he had compassion on them. Our compassion does not stop in giving bread. Our compassion does not stop in giving food. Our compassion does not stop in dealing with the needs of the body. We go beyond and we meet the needs of the soul. Look at Mark chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 34. And you will see what the compassion of the Lord does for every man and what he will do for you. And what he will do for every one of us. Mark chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people. And he was moved with somebody there tell me. 
compassion towards them because that they were a sheep having not a shepherd look at what he did because of the compassion and he began to teach them many things that's the result of the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand? When Jesus teaches you repentance, it's because of compassion. When he teaches you how to turn away from darkness and turn to the light, that's compassion. And when he teaches you how to come out of the hand and the clutches of the devil and come to the very hand of the Savior and be saved, that's compassion. When he teaches you how to get to heaven, eventually after you die, that's his compassion because of his compassion he began to teach them many things what are we saying don't limit the compassion of christ to only eating bread and drinking tea don't limit the compassion of the lord jesus christ to multiplying bread and multiplying the pieces of fish extend that compassion to teaching, extend that compassion to receiving the teaching and the doctrine of the word of God. Have you sometimes found people how they complain? And it's because they don't understand. They say our church, deeper life, they only teach doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. They don't have compassion. How can you say that? Somebody teaching you how to escape hell doesn't have compassion. Somebody teaching you how to get to heaven doesn't have compassion. Somebody teaching you how to have a good marital life doesn't have compassion. Somebody teaching you how to train your children, how to teach your children, how to lead them in the way of righteousness doesn't have compassion. Somebody teaching you how to so live your life that you'll have reward when you get to heaven doesn't have compassion. Or oh, some people say you know in other churches on sunday like this they have a kitchen behind uh, you know their church and those who come to the church they say don't go yet and then they give them a uh, bread and they give them tea i hope our church will do this you know all the time and give a free food to everybody so we can show that we have compassion we have compassion i said we have compassion if I came from all the way where I am and I come to you here and I'm teaching you the word of God, that's compassion. If our brethren come and they're taking this message we're preaching and they're spreading it everywhere and they give their time and they give their skill, that's compassion. And I pray that we will not miss the essence of the compassion of the Lord in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 14 verse 14 I'm looking at Matthew 14 14 and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion look at that and here there's no food here he was moved with compassion there's no fish here he was moved with compassion and up toward them and healed their sick you see the compassion of the lord jesus christ has many branches has many uh, manifestations and has many effects in one branch he gives them food in one branch he gives them fish in another branch he gives them teaching in another branch he gives them forgiveness another branch of that com of that compassion is he healed their sick let's understand then uh, there are many branches of compassion and do not hold on to just one branch to just one branch it's not everybody that needs the food some people need healing some people need deliverance and some people need the joy of salvation and whatever you need the compassion of the lord will supply we're looking at mark chapter one mark chapter one i'm reading from verse 40 mark chapter one we're reading from verse 14 it says in verse 40 and there came a leper to him beseeching him you see this leper his need was not food his need was not water his need was not fish there came a leper unto him beseeching him kneeling down to him and saying unto him if thou wilt thou canst make me clean and jesus tell me then moved with compassion understand the compassion of the Lord is like a stream. It's like a river. And it has many streams. And wherever you are, the stream of compassion will get to you. 
and he put forth his hand and touched him and says unto him I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed immediately. You're cleansing tonight? Immediately. You're washing tonight? Immediately. The manifestation of compassion upon your life tonight? Immediately. Are you there? Is coming upon your life. Micah, I'm looking at Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 18. Compassion, compassion. The manifestation of the compassion of the Lord. In Micah chapter 7 verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity. That passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. Because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. When God forgives you, and he takes all your sins and bundles everything together, and he casts it to the sea of God's forgetfulness, that your sin will never be remembered anymore, that Christ prayed for your sin, and Christ atoned for your sins, and now you're free. Your conscience is free. Your mind is free. Your heart is free. And you have the peace of God from the Prince of Peace. That's compassion. And I pray that that compassion of forgiveness will come come upon your life yeah. I said that compassion will come upon your life yeah. salvation is the result of the compassion of the Lord he feeds our body compassion he feeds the hungry that's compassion he heals the sick that's compassion he forgives the sinner that's compassion he gives salvation to the lost that's compassion let's come back to Deuteronomy now Deuteronomy chapter 30 and I'm reading here from verse 2 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're looking at verse 2. And shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children, your children will be saved. And with all thine heart and with all thy soul, look at this, that then the Lord will turn thy captivity. Every yoke is broken. Every bondage is taken away. You see, it is not just food. It's not just water. It's just not just bread and tea, but the compassion of the Lord. Look at this now. It says, it will turn thy captivity. And what will he do? Have compassion upon thee. Have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Go on to verse 6. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul that thou mayest live is the compassion of the lord that sanctifies us he knows that without holiness no man shall see the lord and if you only give us bread that's not the end of compassion if you only give us a fish that's not the end of compassion but he heals our body he forgives our sins he saves our soul he delivers us from captivity and he breaks the yoke and all the fetters that bound us and he sanctifies us and he circumcises our heart as a result of compassion what you cannot do for yourself to save yourself he does that what you cannot do for yourself to make yourself holy to sanctify you he does that and because of his compassion, he removes that nature of sin. 
He removes that Adamic nature and he removes that sin, that depravity you brought into the world. It is the compassion of the Lord that saves, the compassion of the Lord that sanctifies. And I pray the compassion of the Lord will not be limited in your life. The compassion of the Lord will not be limited in our church. We will have the proper understanding of the word of God. And as we have the proper understanding, that compassion will flow into our lives, flow into our soul, and flow into every part of our existence in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15 verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. Do you remember who said that? That's the prodigal son, a backslider. You know, if you backslider, there's sometimes some people, they backslide. They're no more in the Lord. They're living in sin. And then they go from church to church, and they go from assembly to assembly. They go from fellowship to fellowship. The problem is for the prodigal son, nothing to eat. For the prodigal son, he was hungry. For the prodigal son, the provision had dried up. And now he knew that if I die in this condition, I die as a backslider. You know some backsliders, they say, I'll never go back to that deeper life. I'll never go back to that home church. I'll never go back to where they teach the word of God. They'll be looking for somebody to lend them something. And they borrow from here and they borrow from there. They'll be looking for somebody uh, like a good Samaritan to give them something. And once they find somebody that will give them food or give them money, they say, my problems are solved. Backslider, your problems are not solved with bread and fish. Your problems are not solved with food just to satisfy your hunger. Your problems are solved when you come back from backsliding and you come to the house of the Lord and you're restored. And the compassion of the Lord forgives you. And a new life comes to you again. Look at this. I'm reading from chapter 15 of Luke. And reading from verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Look at verse 20. Are you there? And he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, tell me, and had compassion, compassion. The restoration of the backslider is compassion. The forgiveness of the one who has gone astray, he was saved before. He was in the family of God before. Then he went to a far country and he lived a riotous life. And now he came to poverty and he said, I will return. And he actually returned. And his father had compassion on him and fell on his neck and kissed him. He said, this my son was dead. It's alive again. This my son was lost. And now he is found. That's the compassion. Mark chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 22. In verse 22 on straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's verse 24. Let's go back to verse 22. And oftentimes it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. And if thou canst do anything, tell me now, have compassion on us and help us. The son was demon possessed. The son was lunatic. The son had mental problem. The son had epilepsy. And sometimes that epileptic spirit will drive him into the fire, drive him into the water. And the man came wanting deliverance and wanting release for the son. And he said, have compassion on us. 
the power that sets the captives free the power that sets the lunatic free and the mad person free that's the compassion and it may not be that you're given bread it may not be that you're given fish but you're given deliverance and you are totally free and the devil cannot touch your life anymore and anywhere you go he recognizes you that's a son of God as a child of God I cannot touch him he cannot touch you he will not touch you because the Lord has compassion on us and it is that compassion that brings total deliverance verse 23 Jesus said unto him if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth I believe tonight I believe in my family I believe for every loved one of mine if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes lord i believe lord i believe your faith will not be in vain before i go from that point point one i'm asking a question how many people will god have compassion on and tonight how many people will the compassion of the lord reach anyone there inside here anyone there outside there anyone there hearing my voice now the compassion of the lord is coming to you look at some 145 some 100 and 45 i'm reading from verse 8 145 psalms in verse 8 the lord is gracious and full of compassion the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Look at verse 9. The Lord is good to all. Underline that in your Bible. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercy is over all his works. I receive mine today. You receive in Jesus' name. Let, let's come back now to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we have read from verse 1 to verse 9. We're coming now to verses 10 to 14. Mark chapter 8, we're reading from verse 10 to verse 13. It says, and straightway he entered into a sheep. That is, after feeding the 4,000, after multiplying the bread, and multiplying the fish, and feeding them, and he gathered the remnant, and straightway he entered into a sheep with his disciples, and came into the parts of Dalmanota. And the Pharisees said, uh, came forth and began to question with him seeking of him what are they seeking a sign from heaven tempting him what that means is that they've been expecting the messiah they had been expecting the christ but they were looking for a sign show us a sign you are the messiah he just multiplied bread and 4,000 people were fed, and they were still saying, show us a sign. He opened the eyes of the blind, and he unstopped the ears of the deaf, and the people said, he has done all things well. We have never seen anything like this before. They have not seen any sign. They are still saying, show us a sign. He made the leper to be clean, and when he cleansed the leper, it was by a word. And they have not seen any sign yet. They are saying, show us a sign. And he made the paralytic to rise up and the paralytic rose up that the people that saw that miracle said we never saw anything like this before and these pharisees they still have not seen any sign lazarus was dead four days in the grave already stinking and jesus got there and said take away the stone and he took away the stone and he mentioned his name lazarus come forth and without doing any other thing lazarus came 
came forth he was alive again after four days nine and yet they have not seen any sign and they said show us a sign show us a sign they were sign seekers they were not truth seekers they were sign seekers they were not salvation seekers i pray you'll not be a pharisee you'll not be a religionist they close their eyes and then they complain we can't see you can't see why you are closing your eyes the signs are there all the miracles of jesus christ they were there but if you keep on closing your eyes you will not see somebody is outside and then he looks up and he closes his eyes he says i cannot see the sun can you come and show me the sign that the sun is shining open your eyes and you will see if these pharisees had opened their eyes they will not be seen she also sign. look at verse 12 and he, in verse 12 and he sighed he groaned deeply in his spirit and says why does this generation seek after a sign verily i say unto you there shall no sign be given unto this generation if you've seen all those things have done and you've not seen any sign yet then no other sign will be given unto you you have not seen the sign that this is the christ with all that he did you have not seen that this is the savior with all that he did even the samaritans that you disclaim the samaritans that you belittle the samaritans that you say they are no good at all even those people said now we know not just because of the word of the woman we know that this is the savior of the world you've not seen a sign jesus christ was baptized in water and the voice of god came from heaven this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased you have not seen any sign yet and the holy ghost like a dove fell, came upon him you have not seen any sign yet he walked on water have you not seen any sign yet jesus said okay if you've not seen any sign all those things i have done you're not going to come to me as your savior you're not going to come to me as your healer you're not going to come to me as a deliverer you have not seen any sign yet no other sign then they will perish i pray you will not perish uh, look at verse 13 verse 13 and he left them he had to leave them those sign seekers they saw everything they ought to see and yet they will not believe he left them and entering into sheba again departed to the other side the lord has given quite a lot of signs in fact look at what the bible says in acts chapter 2 acts chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 22 many signs he had given them many signs he had shown them but because they closed their eyes that's why they could not see and i was saying show us a sign show us a sign you know somebody in our church uh, you know saying uh, show us a sign uh, that there are miracles today was all those things you have heard i was all this program that we just finished and you had all those testimonies show us a sign a sign that god answers prayer show us a sign that god saves today show us a sign that god can deliver today we don't need any other sign we know that jesus is all in all he can do everything in our lives and he will do it tonight in jesus name and look at acts chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 22 ye men of israel hear these words jesus of nazareth a man approved of god among you by miracles and wonders and signs a man approved of god among you by miracles and wonders and signs which god did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know as ye yourselves also know they knew but they were not confessing that he had done those signs that's why we'll come to point number two the condemnation of faithless sign seekers the condemnation of faithless sign seekers let's come to matthew chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 I'm reading from verse 2. These are the signs. And Jesus showed the signs. Jesus demonstrated 
the signs and the people that had eyes to see they saw that this was the sign the sign of the messiah the sign of the christ the sign of the savior the sign of the only name that saves there's no other name that that saves they knew and if they will just open their eyes they will know christ had come and christ had appeared and christ has shown enough signs for them to know this is the savior and thank god i know I said, thank God, I know. I've seen enough of Christ. I know all that he revealed and all that he demonstrated. He is my Savior. Somebody there, he is my Savior. Look at Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, when John had heard the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are thou he that shall come, the Messiah? Are thou he that shall come, the Christ? Are thou he that shall come, the Savior of the world? Are thou he that shall come, the appointed, the anointed of the Father? Or do we look for another? Look at verse uh, uh, look at verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, that's a sign. The lame walk, that's a sign. The lepers are cleansed, that's a sign. And the deaf hear, that's a sign. And the dead are raised up from the dead, that's a sign. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them, that's a sign. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. He did it over and over to show them there wasn't anything else they were looking for. Christ had come and Christ had shown this is the one that brings salvation, that brings eternal life. I pray you will not miss it. Yeah. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. Actually, the Pharisees had no excuse. They were pretenders. They were hypocrites. That's why they were saying, just a sign that seen up. Look at one of them coming. It says in John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Look at this. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. We know it. The Pharisees know it. If anybody is saying she was a sign and they say we're still looking for evidence, they're only pretending. He said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Except God be with him. Look at verse 19. Why then are some people so blind? Why then are some people seen? We're looking for a sign. Show us a sign. When one of them said, they all knew that thou art come from God. Look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's the reason they were still coming and saying, show us a sign. There was enough sign. John chapter 7 verse 31. John chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 31. And many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? 
They said, what are the signs that we're going to look for? When Christ comes, if there's another Christ, when the Messiah comes, if there's another Messiah, will he do more miracles? Now watch this man had done, and because of that, they believed on him. Look at John chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 22. John chapter 9, verse 22. These words speak his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. That was the problem. Actually, they had a controversy and then they resolved that controversy. Some people said, this is the Christ. Who else are we looking for? This is the Messiah. Who else are we looking for? And some people say, well, Christ come from Galilee. Uh, check up this and that. And then they resolved that controversy. They said, well, whatever. Whatever he does, whatever he does not do. We're not going to accept him. And if anybody accepts him, we're going to put him, throw him out of the synagogue. And there are some people that are afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. The synagogue did nothing for anybody. The synagogue did not forgive anybody's sin. The synagogue did not save anybody. The synagogue did not heal anybody. The synagogue was just representation of religion, empty religion. And yet there were people that will sell their souls for that religion. And they don't want them to be thrown out of the synagogue. Look at chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 30. Chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, them why herein is a marvelous sin that ye know not from whence he is and yet he has opened mine eyes this was the man that was born blind and now when he testified he opened mine eyes and who do you think he is and he said i know that this is not just an ordinary man because since the world began we have not heard that anyone opened the eyes of the one that was born blind look at verse 31 here in verse 31 now we know that god heareth not sinners but if any man be a worshiper of god and doeth his will him he here is that's the blind man talking he has seen no sign and he said i've seen this is the christ and this is the messiah look at verse 32 since the world began was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind if this man were not of god he could do nothing look at their response they close their eyes they will not see they close their minds they will not see and they made their hearts like Adam and stone, and they will not see. I pray that will not happen to you. Yeah. Look at verse 34. They answered and said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? They don't want teaching. They don't want enlightenment. They don't want the truth to come to them. And they cast him out. The one that will give them evidence, they cast him out. The one that said, what other sign are you looking for? Look at me. I'm in no sign. I was born blind. He opened my eyes. This must be the Christ. They, they said, don't tell us that. They didn't want to see. You will not be like that. Look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 47. John 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and they said, What do we? This private between them, inside their council, they said, What do we? For this man, tell me, this man, tell me, doeth many miracles. You see these pretenders when they come to the open when they're talking to people when they're in their synagogue they'll say show us a sign What's the sign that you are the Christ? What's the sign that you are different from any of us? What's the sign that you are the Messiah? What's the sign that you are the only Savior? But internally, in their council, they said, let's face it. 
Let's tell the truth. This man doeth many miracles. He know, we know he has the sign. We know this is the man. But don't tell the public. We're not going to tell anyone. Look at the verse that follows in verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. That's right. Why don't, do, why don't you want them to believe on Christ? They said, if we leave him alone, if we accept the truth, if we affirm the truth, if we say we know this is the Christ, the people are going to repent and the people are going to turn after him and they'll get to heaven. And so we're not going to leave him alone. We're not going to accept openly. We know it entirely. We know it in our heart. But we're going to pretend that this is not the Christ so that people will not believe. I pray you'll not be a hindrance to those who are getting to heaven. You'll not be a hindrance to those who are to believe. The people who are so sold to religion, they're so sold to superstition. They say, we know that's right. We know that's a good thing. We know that that is the way. But if we say it openly, if we accept it openly, our members and our people, our captives in our synagogue and assembly, they'll go to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will know we're not giving them the truth. Therefore, we're going to bottle them up. We're going to imprison them in the darkness of ignorance. I pray you'll not be bottled up like that. Look at verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, you know nothing at all. You don't know what he has been planning. You don't know what he's going to do. And you don't know how he's going to get rid of that Jesus. He said, as they were discussing, yes, we know he's walking miracle. Yes, we know he's showing many signs. Yes, we know that that is the Christ. And we know that is the Savior. But you don't know anything at all as to what we're going to do. What was he going to do? How was he going to stop Christ? How was he going to remove Christ, the only one that could save? Look at verse 50. Now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die and for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And they speak he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And actually, that's the purpose why Christ came. He came to die for all sinners. Not only the sinners in the land of Israel, the Jews only, but for all over the world. In verse 52, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that was scattered abroad. And that's the reason why Christ went to the cross. That's why he died. And that's why he gave his life. And I pray you will not miss the sign you had given in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 12. Chapter 12 of John. I'm reading from verse 10, chapter 12 of John, verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. Why? Because that's a great sign. A man had died. He had been buried. His name is Lazarus. He was thinking already, and Jesus came, and with the word said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth. And many people not going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, that's a great sign. We're going to stop that sign. We're going to destroy that sign. You cannot do it. Nobody can do it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 11. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. 
that's what annoyed them that's what they didn't want to see but they saw it and there's nothing they could do about it jesus christ is the savior we're looking at john chapter 15 john chapter 15 i'm reading here from verse 22 john chapter 15 verse 22 if i had not come and spoken unto them they had not had sin but now they have no cloak no covering no concealment no excuse for their sin look at verse 24 if i have not done among them the works which none other man did they had not had sin but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father they had no excuse jesus christ has showed them enough signs john chapter 20 i'm reading from verses 30 and 31 john chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 and many other signs look at that he did many signs many signs many signs and so uh, there's no point in saying show us one sign he has done many already and he has given many already and many other signs truly did jesus in the presence of his disciples which one which are not written in this book but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Believing ye might have life through his name. You believe? I believe. I believe. You've seen enough signs, I've seen enough miracles that Jesus Christ has done. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is a Deliverer. He is all in all for us. There's no other sign we're looking for. He died for us on the cross of Calvary. And since you know you are convinced in your heart, now you come to the Lord and you say, tradition will not stop me. Superstition will not stop me. All those people that are still seeking signs and they're not seeking the truth and they're not seeking salvation, they will not stop me. I believe Jesus is the Lord. Salvation will will be yours in Jesus name let's come back to Mark chapter 8 Mark chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 14 Mark chapter 8 reading from verse 14 now the disciples had forgotten to take bread neither a day in the sheep was them more than one loaf and he charged them saying take heed and beware of the leaven of the pharisees and of the leaven of herod and they reasoned among themselves saying it is because we have no bread and when jesus knew it he says unto them why reason ye because we have no bread perceive ye not yet neither understand have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not, and do ye not remember? They are forgotten. They are forgotten. He did it in the first part of this chapter 8, and yet now, as uh, they were going on, that they didn't have any bread, they are forgotten that he can produce bread even out of nothing. He is a creator. He is the one with him. All things are possible. Look at verse 19. When I break five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments to keep up? They say unto him, 12. And when the seven among the 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments to keep up? They said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that she do not understand? How, how, how is it that she do not understand? He had multiplied the five loaves and fed five thousand. He multiplied the seven loaves and fed four thousand. 
And now they were thinking of just themselves, the twelve. If he fed thousands with just those little pieces, how about the seven? Of course, he can multiply that and it will feed them. That's why he was asking them, you don't understand, I'm not talking of bread, I'm talking of the leaven, I'm talking of the air, I'm talking of the falsehood, I'm talking of the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees. I pray you will understand. Yeah. I understand. I understand. I understand. You will understand in Jesus' name. We are looking at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 16, we are looking at verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Look at verse 11. I will say it, that ye do not understand that I speak not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Look at verse 12. Then understood they how then understood they how then understood they how that he bid them not to beware of the leaven of bread but of the of the doctrine of the pharisees and of the sadducees and the lord is still warning us today this point number three now the caution against false shepherds the Pharisees, they thought they were shepherds and they projected themselves as shepherds, but they were false. They didn't want the truth to get to the people. They didn't want salvation to get to the people. They didn't want proper understanding to get to the people. That's why Jesus cautioned his disciples and he said, beware and take heed of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees and of the Herodians. The caution against false shepherds and false prophets and false teachers. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We must understand that it's not everybody that carries the Bible that is a true shepherd. That is the guiding shepherd that guides us in the way of salvation. And therefore, Jesus Christ wants us. You come to him, the true shepherd, you'll beware of the false shepherds. Look at verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. A bought a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. By their character you shall know them. By their lifestyle you shall know them. Actually now we're living at the end of the age. At the end of the time. Because Christ is about to come. And he said that when he is about to come. There will be people who will come like false prophets. And like false teachers. And they will be saying that they are the Christ. And they will even show some signs and for those who are looking for signs they'll be led astray you'll not be led astray i will not be led astray our preachers in our church will not be led astray if a preacher if a pastor if a shepherd is led astray he will lead many other people astray if a teacher if a preacher a pastor in the church cannot discern this is the right way and this is the way of salvation he will lead multitudes of people astray that's why jesus warned his own disciples and he said beware and take heed of these false shepherds and these signs 
seeking shepherds. And let's look at Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Look at that. False prophets. You know, some people think uh, that, you know, if somebody can heal the sick, if somebody can deliver the lunatic, if somebody can rub oil on somebody, and then uh, something will take place, they think that means that that's a good shepherd. That's a true shepherd. Look at what Jesus said. He said, for there shall arise false Christ." and false prophets and shall show great signs and great wonders in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elects i will not be deceived i said i will not be deceived you will not be deceived in jesus name see there are people they come to our church after all that we're doing they go to one corner somewhere one woman is rubbing oil on the tummy of some people there's a place where they're you know doing night vigil there's a place where they're doing this and that and they're even inviting many other members of our church and they're saying come here come there there's a place where they're going to do this for you a place where they're going to do this for you those representatives of false prophets are leading people astray you will not follow them and they themselves so are one leg over there one leg over over here you will not be led astray you'll come back fully and you will take the truth and abide in the truth in jesus name look at verse 25 behold i have told you before the lord said i've told you i've told you behold i have told you before i'm looking at uh, second corinthians i'm reading chapter 11 second corinthians chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 13 second corinthians chapter 11 I'm reading to you from verse 13. The Lord wants us to take heed and will take heed. He wants us to beware, will beware. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles. There are false apostles, there are false prophets. They are false evangelists. They are false shepherds. They are false teachers. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. In verse 15, therefore, it is no great sin if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. What follows here? Tell me out aloud. Read in unison. One, two, three, go. The end of false prophets, the end of false shepherds, the end of false teachers is destruction because it will be according to their works i will not follow them we will not follow them in jesus name look at second thessalonians chapter 2 second thessalonians chapter 2 i'm reading here from verse 9 second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. There are people, they come out, they might mention the name of Jesus, they might open the Bible, they might read some verses of the Bible, but it says, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and what follows? Signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. All those Pharisees didn't have the love of the truth. They were still seeking for another sign after they have seen quite a lot. It says they do not have the love of the truth that they might be saved. I believe you have the love of the truth. 
the truth of repentance and the truth of seeking the Lord and the truth of having salvation and the truth of being new creatures in Christ so that all the old lives, everything is passed away, all things have become new. The love of the truth will never leave us in our church in Jesus' name. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned. Who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You will not have pleasure in unrighteousness. None of us will have pleasure in unrighteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're coming to First, First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 1 and verse 2. First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. You will not depart from the faith. Those who are looking for signs, and there's a lot of signs. They've seen what Jesus Christ has done. Many people he has saved. Many people he has sanctified. Many people he has baptized in the Holy Ghost. Many people he has healed. And many people he has delivered. Many people he has changed their lives, transformed their lives. And they're still looking for signs. They're still looking for signs. Such people are going to be led astray. You will not be led astray. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to say Producing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And because of the conscience seared with a hot, hot iron, they don't have any feeling anymore. They're going astray. They don't have any feelings anymore. They close their eyes to the clear signs of Christ the Messiah, Christ the Savior. They don't have any feelings anymore. They see the truth and they follow error because they don't have any feelings anymore. I pray you'll not be like that. In Second Peter chapter two, Second Peter chapter two, I'm reading here from verse one. Second Peter chapter two, verse one, and there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, false teachers among you. I pray they will not remain in our church who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. The, the Lord had bought them. They were saved. They were sanctified. And with the precious blood of Jesus, they had been redeemed and bought. But then they turned around to deny the Lord. You'll not be a backslider denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways. I'll not follow their pernicious ways. I'll not be among them that will follow false prophets, that will follow superstitious people, that will follow people that are teaching error. I will not follow them. I can't hear you. Make sure that when they come to you and they come to entice you with whatever, with money, with gift, with this and that, you'll not follow them in Jesus' name. And then it says, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. False prophets are going to be damned. You will not take part, you will not share of their damnation in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the loss of the flesh and through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them 
who live in Aaron, while they promise them liberty. False prophets promise a lot of things. They promise job, they promise children, they promise wife, they promise this, they promise this and that. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end of them is worse than the beginning. Your latter end will be better. Yeah. Your latter end will be brighter. Yeah. But you know, if anyone goes after false prophets, false shepherds, false preachers, false doctrine, the latter end will be worse than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, you'll not turn back to your vomit. Amen. You'll not go back to swallow the things you have vomited out in Jesus' name. Amen. And the evil you have left behind, you'll not go back to them. Amen. And the false doctrine you left behind, you'll not go back to them. And the deceivers you have left behind, you'll not go back to them in Jesus' name. Amen. The dog is turned to his, own, to his own vomit again, and so the pig, the swine, that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. And let's come to Jude. I'm reading here from chapter 1. Jude, chapter 1, I read from verse 4. It says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained unto this, condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our, of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and, as, and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first place, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chase under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and uh, uh, set forth as an example, suffering uh, the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. That, that's why the Lord is warning everyone, and that's why He's saying, Beware and take heed of the leaven of the scribes, the Pharisees, and of Herod. And as the Lord has revealed that to us today, we'll not go back into the evil we have left behind in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Lord, is the teacher come from heaven, the wisest and the greatest of all teachers. And he has taught his disciples. He taught them daily. He taught them publicly. He taught them privately. And he taught them everything they ought to know. And yet, you know, he did not assume that his disciples could not be deceived. He still warned his disciples. And he said, beware of the leaven, of the doctrine of the Pharisees. In our church here, we have taught line upon line and precept upon precept. We have taught the word of God without fear, without favor. We have taught the word of God without uh, missing words. We have taught the clear word of salvation. And somebody might say, do you think any of us can be deceived? If they are disciples, direct disciples of Jesus, if they could be deceived. And if he still warned them, that's why he's warning us today. And thank God you will hold on to the truth. 
you will keep the truth you will take heed and you will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints in jesus name false teachers will not deceive you false books will not deceive you false tracts will not deceive you and the false propaganda of the people that are teaching error will not deceive you in jesus name you will stand by christ I will stand by Christ. He is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. He is my Healer. He is my Deliverer. He is the Good Shepherd. I look away from every other shepherd. I look unto Jesus alone, the author and the finisher of my faith. And the Lord will keep you standing in Jesus' name. There is nothing a false prophet, a false teacher, a false apostle, a false whoever, and a false shepherd will give you that Jesus cannot give you. He has done all things well. He will do all things well. Even tonight, he will do all things well. He will feed the hungry. He will deliver the oppressed. He will heal the sick. He will open the eyes of the blind. He will take incurable disease away. He will take your mountains away. And will establish you in the truth that will take you to heaven in Jesus' name. Right, let's rise up now. Let's rise up now. Look away from all the false prophets. And look away from all the false teachers. And look away from all the uh, false uh, propaganda. And call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here am I today. Here am I today. I know that if I'm hungry, you can feed me. I know if I'm jobless, you can give me a job. I know if I'm a sinner, you can save my soul. If I'm a backslider, I know you can restore me. If I'm demon oppressed and demon tormented, I know you can set me free. If there's any challenge in my life, I know you can resolve that challenge. I know you can bring solution to every problem of my life. Open your heart, open your mouth to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I, here am I, here am I. I know you are all in all in my life. All in all in my life. I'll not be a forgetful here. I'll not be a fainting soul. Everything you're providing on the cross of Calvary is available for me. And I'm ready to receive. I'm ready ready to receive tell the lord tell the lord is able to do it is able to do it is able to do it able to save your soul able to forgive your sin able to turn around your life able to break your bad habit able to transform able to set free what can he not do? He's able to remove every mountain in your life. By stripes were healed. He came to fulfill prophecy. And has shown us enough sign. He fulfilled the prophecy. He died on the cross. Call unto the Lord. He will save. He will redeem. He will restore. The prodigal son can easily come back home. The compassion of the Lord does not fail. The sinner can call upon the name of the Lord. He is compassionate and he will save. Tell him to give you the grace to live victoriously. As we're going back home, things are different now. You will not be as you have always been. Let the truth of the world work effectually, effectively in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in your body. Be a steadfast believer, a stable believer, a dependable believer. You'll not look back. You'll not draw back. 
you're not slide back you will stand uncompromisingly for the truth anywhere you are anywhere you go you stand up stand up for Jesus In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. I believe God can do all things. What are you? I believe God can do all things. In my heart, God can do all things. In my soul, God can do all things. In my body, God can do all things. In my family, God can do all things. In my profession, God can do all things. In our local church, God can do all things. And whatever I ask the Lord tonight, God can do all things. I will not go back home empty-handed. God can do all things. Blessings upon your life tonight. In your soul tonight. In your spirit tonight in your body tonight in your family tonight things will turn around for the better in your life raise up those hands raise up those hands father in the name of jesus we thank you because jesus has been giving to us he has given us all the signs we need and we know that he is the christ we know he is the messiah we know he is the savior we know he is the healer we know he is the sanctifier we know he is the deliverer and we know he is the coming king and lord we know that you can do everything necessary in every life here tonight do it in jesus name when anyone comes before you the spirit of death is cancelled and life comes abundant life comes i pray lord for those who are sick with incurable disease with a deadly disease i see they are the terminal point oh lord i pray let life come to them in jesus name mountain move away in jesus name evil move away in jesus name every attack every affliction move away in jesus name lord those who are hungry feed them those who are jobless provide for them and those who cannot take care of their families lord i pray provision from heaven will come for everyone in jesus name are we looking for ways to pay our house rent? Oh Lord, I pray you're a miracle walking God. You're a mountain moving God. I pray, Lord, out of the five loaves and the two pieces of fish, I pray you multiply for every family. You provide for every family. And where there is nothing, let abundance come in Jesus' name. In days of old, you brought water out of the rock lord you can even bring honey out of the rock by asking you lord every dry rock water will come out sustain your people supply for your people i pray lord for everyone without exception who has heard the sound of the voice tonight i pray you will supply every need according to your riches in glory by christ jesus wipe the tears of the eyes of your people away take all the suffering away what man cannot do do it for your people complete provision total salvation entire sanctification abundant power of the holy ghost and total healing and total deliverance joy and happiness in the lord and the names of your people reaching in the book of life in heaven do it for everyone joy happiness laughter abundance super abundance for everyone 
without exception tonight. Bless everyone. Put testimony in every mouth. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I am blessed. I am blessed. Your blessing will never run dry in Jesus' name.